Okay, we are going to switch gears now and we're going to turn our attention to member wellness. And I am happy to turn it over to um, our member wellness council co-chair, Francis Adewale, our member wellness program manager, Dan Crystal, who's online, uh, member wellness co-chair, Matthew Dresden. Uh, we also have the executive vice president of Alps and the president for the institution Institute for Lawyer Wellbeing, Chris Newbold, and advancement director, Kevin Platchy. So I'm not sure what order you all are going in, but I'll turn it over to Kevin. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to kick our presentation off, but before I do that, I would like to introduce Chris Newbold, who is the president of the Institute for Wellbeing and Law. He agreed to come in today to help with our presentation to give an overview of the national scene. So thank you, Chris, for being here today. And online, we have Dan Crystal, who's our program manager for our member wellness program, and he'll be participating in the presentation as well. So to get us started, uh, I would like to just remind everyone sort of how we got here today. Um, a, little, a little while ago, if you remember at our Board of Governors meeting in Bellingham uh, late last year, we had on the agenda uh, agenda item to approve a uh, member wellness council charter. And we agreed to remove that because uh, because there was a there was a need articulated to do more to have a broader understanding of what the issue was, uh, the need for a council or a task force, and to do some more preliminary work and then bring it back. So what we were asked to do, uh, Dan and I, is to work with the Member Engagement Council to provide a presentation uh, to bring everyone up to speed on the Member Wellness Program to uh, give some rationale for why, it, why we're asking for a task force or a council and, uh, and to just give more transparency sort of into what we were doing. So we did that. Uh, we took it to the Member Engagement Council. Uh, Bree Buchanan, who is the past president of the National Institute for Wellness, uh, helped us present to the Member Engagement Council a very similar presentation to what you're going to be receiving today. At the end of that presentation, the Member Engagement Council made several recommendations and voted to um, to adopt those and bring them to the board to ask the board to adopt those re recommendations. So, um, and then the next thing that we were asked to do was to bring a, a presentation to the entire board. So that's what we're doing today. So uh, uh, the outline for our presentation today is I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the history of the well member wellness program within WISPA to give everyone sort of an idea of where it sort of started and where it's evolved up to today. Uh, then I'm going to hand it over to Dan Crystal, who's going to talk about our current member wellness program offerings. And he's also going to talk about how a task force would help um, the WISBA legal profession and also help the WISBA member wellness program expand its reach throughout the state. Uh, and then Chris is where he'll hand it over to Chris after that, and he'll give a presentation about the national landscape of lawyer well-being uh, across the country. And then after that, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, Treasurer Ottawale and Governor Dresden, who are the co-chairs of the Member Engagement Council, who will go over the recommendations that the Member Engagement Council is asking the board to adopt. So. Um, so I'm just going to go briefly over our history. So, and I'm apologize for the wordiness of this slide. I'll I'll go quickly through it. So, um, the member wellness program was formed in 1992, and at that time, it's it was called the Lawyer Assistance Program, uh, which is common terminology throughout the country. Uh, and it was part of a legal services department. It was basically. Uh, member wellness, which was LAP at the time, professional responsibility, and our practice management assistance programs were all inside this one department. So the department consisted of a total of eight employees across those three program areas, and four of those employees were attributed directly to the member wellness program. 
uh, Dan Crystal, who we're, we'll be hearing from soon, joined the organization in 2008. And when it was its own department, what, what the program really focused on was providing in-depth services to a small amount of members. So, so they went deep with members and mental health counseling, uh, but it wasn't broad in breadth. So we were serving approximately 100 members who, who received very deep ongoing clinical help. The other thing with the way it was run is it was also geographically limited to members who were within driving distance and could come in and have consultations. Um, so in 2012, the statewide referendum happened. And on the heels of that, their staffing was reduced to three. Uh, then in 2015, the, the program was reduced further. So it was reduced down to a program manager who was Dan. And then we adopted uh, an employee assistance type of program that was outsourcing the consulting and the counseling services. Uh, so Kepro was the name of that. And we offered three free counseling sessions with a licensed provider to any member that needed it. Uh, this move was really seen as a way, aside from budget cuts and some fiscal issues, uh, the move was really seen as a way to scale the program further. Uh, so instead of giving deep counseling to 100 or so members, this would open it up for members all across the state to at least get three sessions of counseling with a licensed provider. Uh, then in, so that's sort of how we were running from 2015 up to 2021. In 2021, uh, that was when uh, Kyle Shaketti was our president, uh, the board agreed to add an additional staff to member wellness. So at that time, what we did with the staffing change is eliminated our contract with Kepro. That was the, the outsourcing agency that we use for counseling services. So instead of uh, having it outsourced with the new staff ad, which was a licensed mental health provider, we were able to bring counseling and consulting sessions in-house again. So, uh, but at the same time that we did that, we also adopted a telehealth platform because it was important for us to still be able to continue the breadth of services to members across the state. So basically, anyone, anyone, any member across the state has access to at least three counseling sessions per year with either Dan or Adelie, who are both licensed mental health providers. Uh, so uh, we're still scaling it across the state. And so where we are now. So I do want to give you a little bit of an insight into sort of how this all came together once we started downsizing uh, when it was its own department. Once we started downsizing, uh, our practice management assistance program was placed in, a, in our Office of General Counsel. The member wellness program was placed in human resources because it was kind of connected to an employee assistance program, that outsourcing thing. Uh, and then our practice management. And, and so that's sort of what happened with it. It kind of got scattered across the organization and they weren't together anymore. These bodies of work weren't in the same department anymore. So what we started to make a move back to when we were able to get the additional staffing is, is getting this work all back in the under the same department roof again so that they could have synergy working together. So the first thing we did was moved practice management assistance into the advancement department. The next step was taking member wellness and moving it into the de advancement department. And the final leg of that move was taking practice or a professional responsibility, our ethics program, and moving that in. So now we have these three bodies of work back where we started in 19... 92, I believe it was. So yeah. now these bodies of work are back within the same department. We've created a team internally with these three bodies so that they can create synergy among each other. You, it, it may seem that their work's pretty disparate, but if you think about it, member wellness, ethics, and practice management have a lot of overlap. Someone's uh, suffering from anxiety or mental health issues 
could be running into ethics problems. They may have practice management problems. So these three bodies of work really um, collaborate very closely together to make sure that we're meeting the member in all areas of problems that they may be having. Kevin, just a question. I wanted to make sure when you were talking about scaling to the whole state. So at one time, the the people who would need counseling could only they'd have to come in from the area but now with telehealth they're able to access without having to so that we can actually provide those services statewide that's correct um in the old model it was really deep counseling uh there was no limit to it but it was all in person so they had to be within proximity to the office um, and that's really sort of my, uh, what I wanted to do is just really ramp this up and help you understand how the evolution of the program occurred within our, within our organization and where the bodies of work are today. So uh, these three bodies of work are housed within the advancement department, along with our uh, CLE programming, our sections programming, and our mentoring and young lawyer and rural practice programming. So that's that's sort of where these bodies of work are now. And, and I think what I'll do now is turn it over to Dan so he can talk about our current program offerings. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, man, it feels like a long time coming. Um, we've been planning this, this meeting for, for over two years, I believe. First, I wanna thank uh, uh, Treasurer Adewale and Governor Dresden for spending time with us on multiple occasions this winter and spring to better understand what we're seeking to achieve with the council. Um, more than anything, it, is, it just feels so good to have stakeholders. Uh, uh, I've received just commitments of support to the mission of lawyer well-being beyond what I imagined to hear. So I'm really, I'm really reassured by this. Um, we are a program that uh, did not have stakeholders for many years. It was a dry period for a while. And that, that changed when Kyle Shikhetti became bond president a couple, three years ago, I guess. Um, and I, I just appreciate the support we've received in those conversations. Additionally, I'd like to thank Doug Ende for his contributions to our charter. And more than anyone, I wanna thank Kevin Clayche because he, uh, um, he's been tireless and to, to work with him is to know how competent and dedicated he is. So uh, thank you. Um, I'll speak a little bit about our current program offerings and then why a council. Um, our program provides uh, clinical features for people who have current mental health challenges and prevention features like trainings. Uh, in order to fill the ecosystem with positive messages about wellness, self-care, and mental health. Um, in terms of the clinical features, our counseling sessions, as Kevin stated, it's three sessions per member per episode of care. Um, if someone's reaching out to us with a question, it can just be a question. We don't turn it into counseling, okay? Our idea is not to prolong or shorten on, on the clients, but to provide care in proportion to the need. Of course, if there's a more emergent issue, while there is an emphasis upon finding referrals, uh, we can go past three sessions. Um, some of our more urgent or consequential counseling sessions are not with people in crisis, but, pe but attorneys concerned or, or uh, uh, employees of attorneys concerned about their well-being or spouses of attorneys concerned about their well-being. Those are often the more emergent cases. Um, additionally, uh, we provide group counseling. And uh, by the end of this year, now that uh, we hired Adelie Ruiz in January, and she's doing a fantastic job with pre presentations and leading groups and extending our reach. And the goal by the end of the year is to have three ongoing groups. Uh, our Healing Minds group starts in a few weeks, and that's for more severe mental health challenges or addiction, and that would be a bi-weekly group um, in a support group format. And then um, we're going to 
I've led the job group, job group for about 12 years, and we're resuming that on a monthly basis. We'll get speakers in, we'll do resume review, and we'll help people think about what their next step is. That's, that's, um, that's always been a very popular offering from our program. The third uh, group we want to lead is uh, one for stress management and productivity. So maybe not as severe mental health challenges, but the daily stress of practicing as an attorney and making hay. And I'm hoping that Margot Green, our practice management advisor, will help lead that group because she has great solutions for, for increasing attorney productivity. So uh, individual counseling is free and it's provided by a mental health provider. And then we also have groups led by the same providers. Continuing ed includes, uh, 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 we do two legal lunch boxes a year and one additional free CLE a year. These get a, about 1,800 attorneys involved um, and we pick those uh, messages very carefully. Additionally, we have done 11 uh, presentations thus far this year and we have 12 more in the hopper. It's mid-May. I wouldn't be surprised if we did 30 to 40 presentations this year which is a wonderful uptick from, from previous years. I'll mention also that MCLE is considering adding a mandatory uh, wellness-based CLE per reporting cycle, which will lead to a dramatic uptick in need for presentations and to manage a speaker bureau for that. Um, we have a cohort of peer advisors, which are attorneys supporting other attorneys. Uh, it began and in many ways still is uh, uh, based on addiction issues, someone to walk you to a meeting or, uh, um, uh, you know, takes one to no one sort of situations. Um, but the definition is broadened so that uh, um, people in mid-career transition, people considering retirement, um, attorneys at lots of different situations, uh, managing uh, parenthood and, and being an attorney. We have, uh, we have many stripes of peer advisors. Uh, we do a well-being week in law, uh, which uh, had three offerings the first week of May this year. We did a mentor link mixer, a half-day CLE, and then a wellness-based event. So uh, th that's an annual tradition we have. Um, in terms of communications, we have a newsletter that go goes out three to four times a year to the, to the membership, uh, website updates, a YouTube channel, uh, blog articles, and we write for bar news. Um, outreach is a big component of our work. Often the outreach happens in the context of a CLE, but we outreach the UNBAR Attorneys AA group and, and other addiction groups statewide. We outreach the Judicial Assistance Services Program, law schools, law firms, minority bar associations, county bar associations. It's a long list. Um, and finally, the diversion program is... Uh, uh, actually a big part of my work with the Office of D Disciplinary Counsel where we evaluate attorneys who receive grievances and create a treatment plan for them to follow through with to, in order to avoid discipline. So uh, that's, that's a summary of what our program's up to. Now, before I talk about why a task force, I, I want to talk, just mention that uh, attorneys through, and I can cite lots of research, experience roughly two to three times the rates of addiction, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and other mental health sequelae um, compared to the general population. So the work we do, it's, it's not just caring for individuals, but it's a cause. It's, it's an important mission to not just the providers, but the people invested in this. And to work siloed with just another provider creating features of a program is one thing, but to promulgate this mission is what's so important about a task force. It's an announcement to the profession that your well being matters. Now, this storyline with the well being movement. Um, and by the way, well-being is just the flip side of mental health. It's, it's not different. Um, it's, it's a shinier name, but talking about mental health can be gray and can be off-putting for a lot of people. And we changed our name from the Lawyer's Assistance Program to the Member Wellness Program 
because that was important that people feel like they can achieve well-being through our services. And Lawyers Assistance Program also led a lot of people to call us looking for a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, and, and actually we were the first in the nation to make that change and now several labs have switched names accordingly. Um, so in 2017, uh, the ABA's Commission on Lawyers Assistance Program issued the Path to Lawyer Wellbeing um, that was authored by Chris Newbold, among others, who will speak after me. And Doug Ende was one of the peer reviewers. Um, and it offered 44 recommendations for legal institutions. It's a large number. Um, the recommendations were myriad. Um, you know, this was to, to law schools to help uh, students anticipate hurdles within psychological hurdles that the, in the profession they're entering. It's to law firms. One of the pieces of low-hanging fruit for that has been to help them to better communicate leave policies to their employees, to liability insurance providers, to make sure whether or not questions about an applicant's psychiatric history are actually correlated with the amount of risk they're taking on or were just vestiges of any previous era. Um, to, to the bench, you know, um, there are several sort of daunting reports in the last three years about a judiciary that has quite high rates of depression beyond that of other lawyers, trauma based on decisions they've made, insomnia based on decisions they've made, and even suicidal ideation at a disproportionately high, high rate. Um, other recommendations are to bar associations, LAPS, um, the Office of Disciplinary Council, Character and Fitness Committees. It's, it's a very interesting report that takes some time to explore. And I think uh, Chris will do that more of that for us. Um, so why a task force? We are looking to institutionalize wellness as a priority within the legal profession. Lots of the different domains of the profession that I spoke to are covered by other sections, committees, um, and groups. Um, but to have the primary central focus be the well-being of those in those groups, it's a completely different lens. And you know, one of the first things I want to do with a task force would be to do a survey of member well-being. Um, and we do a lot of surveys through the bar, excellent surveys, uh, focus groups, all kinds of really well-organized surveys, but they're mostly about the members' uh, uh, of perception of WSBA. Um, and it's very useful that, that that's done. But I want to ask questions about their experience as attorneys. Um, know whether they regret getting into the profession or what are the, big, the biggest hurdles or is it interpersonal stress? Is it a lack of time? Is it financial challenges? I want to know um, rates of uh, depression, anxiety, addiction, uh, and, uh, and other uh, psychiatric challenges. And this would be an anonymous survey that would be followed by a uh, bar news article that would in depth convey to the leader, the membership, what we found and show that we care. Um, so that, that's that's one one objective I would want out of the task force. Um, with, uh, but I, I don't want to say too much, but the, my real point here is that we have a lot of spokes that we would address through a task force with the hub being member wellness. And I would argue that there's not a better venue. There's nowhere else in Washington that can do this in this kind of comprehensive way. It can't, it's not gonna be done by the trial lawyers or, or the criminal defense lawyers or, or uh, different sections, or, or there are some larger groups, larger county bars, but to do, to do a thoughtful job, there's, there's no one else who can step up and do this. It's being done in 30 states at this point, and I would love to join this movement. Um, and I think we can do this in a way that is uh, is thoughtful, and it doesn't have to be too time intensive or costly for the bar. Um, so uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone, um, and I'll, I'll hand the baton over to Chris. Awesome. 
Well, thanks everybody first uh, for the invitation to join you today. Uh, Kevin and Dan and I have been talking quite a bit about this issue of late and, and my hope here is to provide you just a, a general sense of the national perspective. Um, let me first just get kind of get out of the way that uh, my day job is as Executive Vice President of Alps Malpractice Insurance. We're a partner of yours and uh, we thank you for the trust that you employ in us in our ability to provide legal malpractice insurance to your attorneys, in particular to the solo practitioners and the small firms, right? Because that's oftentimes the ones who are most ignored uh, in, in, in the insurance space. So, uh, you know, when, when I think about the lawyer well-being issue, obviously healthier lawyers, if I'm being admittedly bi uh, biased here, healthier lawyers probably have less claims, right? Um, healthier lawyers probably create less stress on your disciplinary um, avenues, right? Um, and as I as I as I think about, but but as I think about this movement, um, I, there's a there's a couple of things that kind of come into play for me. First, um, on April 1st, I facilitated a panel down at the Western States Bar Conference. President Dan was there, Tara was there, Francis was there, Brian was there. And I started it like this. Imagine a scenario in which lawyers were happier and healthier than they ever, had ever been in our lifetime. Stress was down. Anxiety was down. Um, depression was down. And the rate of suicides within our profession had been cut in half. Imagine a profession in which we had achieved a level of work-life balance where associates felt like they could go into a senior partner and be vulnerable about some of the challenges that they're facing. A profession in which lawyers from historically underrepresented minority groups um, felt a sense of inclusivity, of belonging in this profession. Um, going into the profession, going into the pandemic, I think it was fair to say that all of the statistics, and I think Dan already mentioned this, we're pretty grim. And then we had a then we had a pandemic, right? And then we experienced a whole nother set of different issues. Uh, and, uh, and 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 unfortunately, that vision I had to put out there because it was April Fool's Day, right? It was April 1st, right? And and unfortunately, I think we have to I I, I gotta be honest, I'm just uh, uh I'm an insurance guy but I'm really a person that just genuinely cares about advancing the profession and leaving a better profession than I found it, right? And when I think about that task, I think about the number of my law school classmates who have generally been dissatisfied with going into the practice of law. When I go around the room, and oftentimes I do this when I speak nationally and ask, would you recommend your son or daughter go to law school? And less than half of the hands actually go up in the audience kind of feel like there's an issue there, that there's a problem there, that there's an opportunity there, and there's an opportunity that sits at the hands of decisions and discussions like this, where you have the ability to lean in and use your leadership abilities to be able to say, let's do more here. Let's do more in this particular area. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm an insurance guy. I love doing this stuff much more than I love doing the insurance stuff. Right, because this is about. This, I almost feel like this is like social movement stuff. How do you transform a culture that has been kind of on a rough path and make it a better culture? Right, and I think about things like how the military transformed their culture from one of heavy substance abuse to a very athletically, physically fit force. Right, you think about those types of dynamics. And I'm not. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a drug and alcohol counselor just an ordinary guy that cares about lawyers and the profession being a better profession, right? And so that's why I'm here today. That's why I decided to get involved in the lawyer well-being movement. And, and um, again, let's go to the next next slide. There's a quick picture and we'll go back one, one more, just to, you know, again, and I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, my, my wife's an attorney, right? So we're, we're kind of dealing with this on a lot of different fronts, right? The, the ability to be able to juggle one of the kids are sick, who's going to take time off of work, who's going to manage, who's going to do, who's going to do those particular things. So, um, you know, and again, I, I've done a lot in the well-being space. I, I co-host co a podcast. 
Um, I, I've been the co-chair of the National Task Force on on on, on uh, lawyer well-being, and I'm currently president of 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 I Will, which was a think tank that was created to ideally be able to attract the monetary funds for us to continue to accelerate the movement at a much faster pace than it has been um, based upon volunteer engagement and volu uh, being a volunteer-driven uh, movement. So next slide, Kevin. So I'm not gonna get into the problems. You, We already know the problems, right? I wanna talk more about solutions. I think, uh, I remember Francis asking me a question at Western States and he's like, you know, seems like we talk about this a lot, but what, what's the action that's being done, right? And I think that we need to get as a movement, the movement, I would say, well, quick go to the next slide, Kevin. Uh, the report came out in, 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 uh, in, in 2016, right? So it's been seven years since the report. I, I would pose to you that this issue is actually being talked about now more than it ever has been. And if you track legal trends, there's a real there's a there's a there's a reality that happens in the legal world in which an issue is hot and then it subsides and then it's and then something else kind of comes in very rarely have you seen an issue like this on a legal trend basis that has sustained kind of front burner um, attention for such a long period of time and i think one of the reasons why is because it's it has struck a nerve and there's a lot of people who are naturally have their own um, stories about the challenges that they have faced that they are sitting there going, you know what, I agree and I want to lean in on this issue. And these are your members. These are these are your members at this point in time. So again, the, the great thing about the report, it was a catalyst to begin a national dialogue. But now we need to be thinking more strategically about how does the dialogue move away from just education and awareness to systemic change and a culture shift that puts well-being as a core centerpiece of professional success. And I don't think it generally has been uh, at this particular point. So the report, again, it, it really looked at the judges, the regulators, the legal employers, the law schools, the bar associations, the LPL carriers, and the lawyer assistance programs. It looked at all those stakeholder groups as saying, let's bring these groups together to engineer the shift in the culture that's necessary for us to leave this profession better than we found it. Next slide. This is probably the, the, the most important one. If I was sitting in your shoes, why would I consider doubling down on, on well-being? I'll give you three reasons. One, as a unified bar, and, and you all know this well when you go to the national meetings, there has been a movement that has said we need to become more than just regulators. We need to really think about where our members are at and how we can provide value to our members. I don't think that there are many issues in which you can provide better value than giving lawyers the tools to think about how to advance themselves individually as human beings first and as lawyers second. Okay. So it's, I think it's, I think this is a play that's really thoughtful and it's realistic in terms of an area where you can have impact on your members. And particularly, there's one subsection of your membership that I think is particularly important for state bar associations. And we talked about this at Western States. It is the small firms and the solo practitioners. Because if you think about the large firms, they generally have enough staffing and resources to be able to think about how to tackle this issue. Um, the reality is, I think the organized bar through the state bar ecosystem, so to speak, I think is ideally situated to be able to provide resources and 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 uh, and and tools for your solo practitioners. And I think that that's actually been at this point, if I had to give a grade to the well-being movement, the blind spot for us at this point has been the solo has been the solo pra practitioner community. And I'm really hopeful that one of the key catalysts that will lean in on that particular community of folks, is state bar associations, right? The folks who sit in on this room and make the decision of where resources go from member dollars. So again, the other element that I think is really um, helpful is at a time in which uh, engagement into bar associations has generally been going backwards, this is an issue we're seeing people actually jump in, right? So this is, I think the creation of a task force or a council, I think could be a really interesting on-ramp 
for people to come into the state bar from an activity perspective that would give new energy and new passion to this particular issue. Um, so again, I, I always think about state bars as how do we increase our relevance to our members? I think this is a, a, a nice, it, it, it's an imperative issue that I think that you can advance. Um, go back uh, one more time, um, one, one more. So the second one that I, uh, one, one more, You're, we were rolling through them. So member engagement. The second one I would say is why do state bars exist? You generally exist to regulate the profession of law. If we're not doing our best to maintain the health and well-being of the lawyers who serve the clients, we're defaulting on our obligation to the public. I, I, I can't say it any more clearly. Um, you know, if, if we allow our lawyers to go into these dark spaces, create disciplinary issues, create malpractice issues, harm themselves in the process, you know, there's an ethical integrity and professionalism about this issue. I think this falls squarely within the regulatory framework for, from which state bars really think about their mission first, which is protection of the public. And then last, the humanitarian uh, element of this, right? We're all human beings before we're lawyers, right? And if you've seen one lawyer, you've seen one lawyer. And we're all dealing with different issues about the way that we've come in. I happen to be a first-generation lawyer who knew nothing, first-generation first college graduate, right? I didn't know anything about going to college. I didn't know anything about coming into this profession. Um, I came from a military brat background, right? But we all come at at, at, at coming into this profession from very different perspectives. The question is whether, again, are we allowing a profession uh, from a cultural perspective to welcome everybody into that mix so that ultimately, and again, I, if I think about this at the highest philosophical levels, it becomes for me about the, the notion that um, we need to have a healthy legal system because a healthy legal system and the rule of law are a, bed, a, a bedrock of democracy. And it's we are stewards of trying to advance that particular legal profession. Let's go, let's let's go through the next ones pretty pretty quickly. So again, the general recommendations for bar associations: acknowledge the problem and take responsibility. The reality is you're doing a lot of great stuff, right? You are you, what everything that Dan outlined. I mean, you are already, um, I, I would say, checking the box. I think the question that that Dan and others are posing now is: um, Do we feel like we can take this commitment to our members and double down on it? in notable ways. I know, I, I, I sit in a lot of these meetings and I see a lot of task forces created and a lot of councils created. And generally I'm pretty skeptical about, does actually anything ever come from those task forces or councils, right? Um, and you can spend a lot of time researching stuff. And, and the reality is, I think ultimately, I have a high degree of confidence that in this particular realm, there will be a list of recommendations that are developed that will be thoughtful. And then it will be a question for this leadership group as to where do you want to go on the appetite spectrum from a resource commitment perspective, or what, where is it that you're going to want to go? Because there's a lot of things that you could be doing that every state bar could be doing that we're just not doing at present. Thank you so much, Chris. And, and um, I, I, okay. So you three, I, I guess I have a question just, and I, is that old saying about knowing your audience? And so I'm, I'm not, I hope I don't um, offend anybody here. Um, obviously, most of you who know me, you know, I, I don't drink or very, very rarely will I ever drink. But um, starting in law school on every single, um, you know, social thing, pretty much that involves the law involves booze it seems like i mean the old saying if you want to get somebody to come somewhere bring them booze right and then like you know i know show up so i'm curious the three of you from a best practice standpoint should, should state bars look to um, i'm you need to, i'm i mean make what i'm saying i mean i mean should um we look to limit functions that uh, that have booze or should we you know go dry i mean which i'm, I'm sorry I, I, what you know kind of thing you know so but i i am curious i mean yeah. your thoughts on, yeah on, i on mean that. here's what i would Thank say you. to that is um you know again I, I just think that you need to be uh thoughtful about the manner in which you 
you know, what you're looking for out of bar events. I mean, if they're going to be alcohol centric, that's one thing. I drink. I'll just let you go. Oh no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to pour our makers and Coke. Right. So it's, it, not everybody in this movement, I think there's sometimes the perception that it's, you know, but I, I, I just think that, you know, you just need to be thoughtful about, you know, maybe there's mocktails available. Maybe there's other things that are available where it doesn't feel like if you're not drinking, you're out of place that you don't belong. Right. So it's that, cause it's just kind of those notions that you, you do, um, coordinate and execute a lot of networking events just be thinking about what's the objective in those events and what what works for your membership i'm not going to prescribe to you that you need to go dry um i just think you need to be uh, realistic about you know what's the tone what's the message that you're sending in the events that you're ulti ultimately hosting so um, you, let me just quick, let me, let me finish the presentation and I know let's get, let's get kind of more to the question. So acknowledge the problem. Um, that's, that's kind of an easy one. Um, partner with your, with your member wellness programs that, that's already happening, uh, here in Washington, uh, promote again, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, I'm, I'm a really staunch advocate of a, of a sense of whether pe people feel like they belong in this profession. Um, I, 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 I really uh, I really wonder, and we, we're endeavoring to engage in some research at IWIL about historically uh, lawyers from historically underrepresented communities about whether they feel a sense of belonging in this profession or not, and what some of those feelings are so that we can understand and then navigate those particular issues. We, we believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion is on a kind of a parallel track to wellness, and you can't really speak about one without the, without the other. And then... Uh, so here's the one that I just kind of wanted to point out to you. I would love to add you to this list. I will would love to add you to this list. Um, these are states that have said, you know what, we're going to bring together the various stakeholders that have an impact on well-being, whether it's law schools or or, or judges. We we need to we need to bring the right people in the room and facilitate a conversation that moves us toward action on this issue. And and again. That's that's not dismissing what you're currently doing because what you're currently doing I think is is fantastic. But to think about what's the next frontier, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about member benefits. Obviously, Alps is one of those for uh, WSBA members. I think that there are two frontiers. The next two frontiers of member benefits in the legal profession are one wellness tools that you can provide to your members. And then the other one, which is a totally different conversation, um, which is your ability to help members navigate the, the, the upcoming artificial intelligence move in our profession. I think that those are the two areas of member benefits that are um, outside of legal research are probably the, the, the fastest growing areas for potential member uh, engagement. But again, coming back to this list, um, you know, I, the great thing about you're not seeing your name on this list at this point is that a lot of uh, states have already taken their run at, at a task force and we know what's worked and what hasn't worked and you can learn from those best practices and put your talent and your and your stakeholders um, through, I think, a really healthy process to get them toward action more quickly. What we got next. Uh, just a couple of examples. I, I'm not. I'm not actually going to go through these. All I'm going to say is um, there's a lot of good examples of really healthy task forces that have moved to the action stage in the Western United States. Utah being one. Um, New Mexico, I think, is the is the next slide on deck. Um, you know, again, investing pretty significant resources in in making wellness a core component of a, of a member service delivery model. And then what's next? Um, and then again, just, just best practices if you decide to do this. Um, I, I highly encourage judicial involvement. Uh, states in which they have included their state Supreme Court in the stakeholder as a stakeholder group, um, that's been much more positive. Um, uh, you know, thinking ab about, um, uh, you know, w when you think about creating this task force, I like to think about it from a strategic planning perspective. Bring people together, assess what the what the needs are, assess what the hopes are, prioritize what you can do, understand what the budget is, and get to work. Right? Um, I don't think you need 38 page reports. Right? Just, just kind of, you know, kind of understand where you want to go. Um, appreciate that your member wellness program efforts are going to dovetail into that. 
Um, and at the end of the day, I know a lot of well-being gets couched in terms of substance abuse, depression, stress, and anxiety. You know, I really think that this is a this is a place where we're looking to give lawyers the tools to thrive. And if lawyers thrive, the profession thrives. And if the profession thrives, you know, we're we're a more valuable part of society and what our charge is as a profession. So let me let me stop there and we'll open up for for questions or I'll give it hand it off to the co-chairs of the of the committee. Todd. Great. I'd uh, like to thank you and uh, all the presenters, Dan, and uh, the other presenters uh, for a great presentation. One of the things that uh, I'm kind of wondering, when I scroll and back and look at the dates and some of those task force forces in some of the states, for example, uh, it, it seems like one of the things we've seen over the last several years has been <clears throat> legalization of other uh, drugs. Uh, I mean, you know, 20 years ago, this was all about alcoholism, you know, anything else was just, you know, illegal. And, and there was, you know, that was just a your, your problem, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of kind of approach. But having also been at, at the big firms and seeing kind of the, the, the kind of the proliferation of of what falls in that umbrella of well-being you know are we talking about you know introducing yoga and meditation and mindfulness and blah 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 you know i mean it can really get out there it, it do a, a really broad array of of kind of benefits if you think about overall well-being you know because even kind of reflecting back on this morning's uh, aging issue cognitive impairment and mental mm -hmm. uh, uh capacity is, is a really uh concerning issue particularly as as you know the demographics start affecting attorneys and as as the aging uh, population begins to suffer some of the effects of natural effects of aging and, and reducing mental ca capacity and, and cognitive skills and you know I guess maybe if you could address how those other kind of issues, particularly with regards to drug um, legalization, and clearly, you know, this, this, the state legislature acted yesterday, I guess, and yeah. now our, we're back into a different <laughs> comple complexion already again today, you know, from, from yesterday. But uh, if you could maybe address that briefly. Do yeah, I, you know, again, these are these are just obviously personal opinions. But, uh, you know, when you think about when, when I think about, you know, when I think about lawyers and and when they face adversity and that stress and that anxiety, I think that there's a tendency to then turn to self-coping mechanisms. And I would just generally say that, you know, obviously drug involvement is one element of that. Whether the legalization accelerates that or not, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can only speculate that, uh, you know, I, and, and I'm raising teenagers right now and trying to stay ahead of what, what's going on in high schools. And more of the, more of them are turning away from alcohol and more toward drug use um, than the alcohol use, right? And then there's obviously different ways to consume that than and easier ways to consume that than ever before. So, you know, I just think I, I just think that they're I don't want to say that they're all kind of part of the same ecosystem of self -co self coping elements, but just you know, my, my, my sense is that, uh, you know, if, again, if we, if we give lawyers the tools to, you know, focus on the core elements of a holistic well-being approach, that there's less of a notion of maybe wanting to go toward that as a, as a, as a tool, but I'd be curious what others think as well. Well, just, just briefly, the other thing that I've kind of observed is that particularly in these large pressure cookers, they've got this array of great things, but you don't really have the opportunity or you there's a lot of pressure not to avail yourself of that stuff because you still have billable hours char you know yeah. pressures and you still have all these other you know court dates and you know deadlines and all this kind of stuff and it, and none of that's alleviated just by virtue of the fact that hey I put it all on hold to to address my wellness you know it doesn't you know those problems don't go away and those co you know coping yeah. just becomes you know almost a, a, a an escape mechanism that doesn't really you know, change your, your overall situation. So it's yeah. uh, kind of a, a tough, uh, it's 22. I mean, for a lot, in a lot of situations, you know, even where those are available. And, and I think it's, I, I, I just want to say this because I, I know that oftentimes it's, it's being thought in the room, which is, you know, wellness doesn't mean, I think the, the gentleman up here earlier said, it doesn't mean that you have, that, that you're moving away from what your responsibilities are as a lawyer. Right. And, and, and I, I don't know, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, 
is 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 the billable hour part of the problem I, I, you know you, you could argue it is right um, you could you could argue that you know when it's a 2100 hour requirement that, that there's a reality of what that means and what the expectations are and when you want to go to that christmas program or you want to drop off your kids um and and you, and you do that are you feeling guilty or are you feeling like you actually own the balance in your life right and and you know i, I would love to 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 continue to um think about and I think it's going to be really interesting as well with the advent of artificial intelligence about how some of those things continue to evolve about how the delivery of legal services evolve and 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 you're looking at a tool that could potentially significantly increase efficiency um, and get lawyers out of doing a lot of the stuff that they don't want to do and kind of up the legal services model you know so there's just, there's there's a lot of elements to the wellness discussion that goes into business models um i think i think it's it's fair to say that most of corporate america has adopted wellness why because they're looking at talent optimization from their existing staff they're look at they're looking at talent attraction in terms of getting new folks in i think somebody said Oftentimes, as employers, we're now being interviewed by the people that we're looking to give, who we've granted interviews, and they're asking, "What? tell me what it's going to be like to work here, right? What type of culture do you have? Is this the type of culture where people, you know, naturally kind of like each other, or is this kind of a you know, backstabbing type of a culture? You know, you're not going to ask that, right? But but just that there's that notion of, you know, I, I think I think the big firms are, are um are being really in, are really being strategic about their leaning in on this issue because of talent attraction and then ultimately talent retention as well um, as as part of their business model. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, now we are going to do a presentation and we're going to go to the next stage of this walk. That is to explain to you what the recommendations are from the Member Engagement Council. Uh, this recommendation is going to be before you uh, for your consideration. But we learned something this morning that I want us to put into practice. That is the balance scorecard. What will be the balance scorecard for this recommendation we are asking you to make? Um, our mission statement says, one of the things on our mission system is to serve the members of the bar. So I can I can check that off. When we are, what we are asking you to do, we serve the members of the bar. Principle number one of our principle, which I will call objectives or purpose, is to provide relevant and valuable resources to achieve professional excellence. I believe that what the recommendation we are asking you to make today will help us achieve that. The balance scorecard would have to be member focused and it also ought to be equity focused as Chris has explained to us. So you could see that what we are asking you to consider today, we are leaving it. I could have talked more about what I hope we will be able to achieve with this, uh, with this proposal, but we don't have much time. I will see the stage of my co-chair much interest. Thank you, Francis. Um, so I think we have up on the screen here uh, what, uh, yeah, right, centered right there. So um, this is from the Member Engagement Council, and these are the recommendations. And so kind of the, the next stage here is that we are going to um, uh, just sort of give voice to the uh, to the proposal, the recommendation from the Member Engagement Council. Uh, which is that we do these three things here. Uh, one, add member being, member well-being to the Board of Governors goals that are adopted in June 2023. I'm just saying them because I, I'm, the next thing will be <laughs> suggesting that we uh, someone make a motion. Uh, number two is work to create a council or task force to study the issue of member well-being and report back to the Board of Governors. Proposed charter would come back to the board for approval at a later date. And, and the point here is that we're we're asking uh, or recommending that that a that a, uh, a task force or council be created, but that that's not what we're voting on right now. We're voting on to have, I think this would be Kevin and Dan and perhaps others to come up with a specific charter, a plan for what that what that task force slash council will be doing, what its time time frame will be, et cetera, so that we can have a specific proposal to to vote on. 
Uh, and then uh, number three is, I think, really just kind of tied to number two, which is that in creating the new entity focused on member well-being, keep the work of the task force slash council connected to the member engagement council. Parentheses. That is, well, I don't know what this what is. Being <laughs> well, task force. Uh, so the, basically, that the 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 task force uh, will be working in conjunction with the member engagement council as it as it does its work. Um, so with that, I will uh, sort of conclude our, conclude our presentation. Uh, Alec, I, I see you have your hand up. I know that Brett and Sanitha also had their hands up from before. But so uh, I think what we're what we're hoping for uh, is that there will be a some discussion and then if this is something that people would like to move forward and we hope that it will be uh that there's a motion to approve the uh the recommendations so with that over to you Al. because i think you can uh, have the discussion if you have something in front of you i'm moving to approve the recommendations thank you All right. Can we call the vote? Um, there's questions, so let's let's take them first. Um, okay, Sunita. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm really excited about the idea of this task force. I think it's fantastic, um, and I think it's an incredible benefit for our members. It's going to improve competence, um, and I am pleased to see that the issue of DEI is going to be addressed and um, to the extent that you can address it. <laughs> um, but I have a question, uh, and I don't know to whom I'm directing the question. Um, for the states where there was Supreme Court involvement, what does anyone know what level of involvement that was? And for example, did the court provide funding or were they part of the decision making prog you know process in sort of developing the program um i wonder if someone could speak to that yeah i'll speak to that um in most cases the the uh, oftentimes the court was responsible for the creation of the task force it looks like in this instance this will be something that the state bar is going to do in in many instances um the the court itself um said we need we need to do more on this particular issue um and then on a funding perspective um uh i i don't know that i think a lot of it has been the the gathering of stakeholders together uh without necessarily a kind of a funding component to it uh although oftentimes what the recommendations then translate into are uh, recommendations in terms of the use of member dues, perhaps, or other uh, structures to be able to generate revenue to be able to fund develop to fund program work. Um, so a lot of it, come, a lot of it will come down to um, bringing the stakeholders together as a first step, um, assessing where the legal market is in terms of where you want to go from a priority perspective, and then thinking about the resource element. Um, I'll give you one example: um, the state of Virginia. Um, they decided to kind of go all in on this, and they they actually uh, assessed a hundred dollar wellness fee on the licensing due dues for every member, and they now have you know ten people out across the state basically doing wellness work, um, and so th that's that's an outlier. Um, most states are not uh, willing to go to that extent, um, but I think there's there's um, good examples across the entirety of the spectrum as to, you know, um, seeing opportunities and then saying, well, where, where do we want to go with those, um, either with member dues or petitioning the court for other fund development opportunities. And uh, to further add on Brayton, I agree with Chris. Um, when I asked that question at the Western Bar Conference, uh, Western Bar Leaders Conference, one of the answers they gave me was that having a joint program that includes judges and lawyers, take this thing out of it. Yeah. Take the idea that you cannot be a lawyer and have a, a crisis issue and still be on track to become a judge. So having that program together, having that program where they plan to program together, the 
executive program together is very effective. And that is where the Supreme Court is involved. If the tax force that we are setting up work well, it would we would include BJA, we would include DMCJA to be part of they are they are uh, according to past president Tolepsin, they also have a similar program that we can work together to make this better. Yeah, and then and, and real quick, just a, a quick add-on point to that. We, we've been um, really intentional in terms of the change in the terminology away from lawyer well-being to well-being in law. Yeah. Right, because well-being in law also means that the folks who work in a support capacity at law firms, they just can't be ignored in this mm -hmm. kind of movement, right? And and so whether it's judges, support staff. You know, it's it's the totality of people engaged in the legal profession um, that has really become kind of the broader focus as opposed to just lawyers um, as a specific focus. Brad. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I'm I'm a little curious and I'm I'm all in favor of the member well-being, but I'm a little curious of the breadth of that mm -hmm. being this is that. Chris, what I'm understanding you're talking about is really kind of the mental health aspect of that, you know, abuse issues that potentially arise. But that, I mean, that may be caused by a myriad of, of problems, mm -hmm. one of which you just being the stress of working on billing hours. I don't, you know, realistically foresee that saying that the bar comes up with, with a, a task force that says that, you know, law firms should not require their associates to work more than 1,200 hours a year. Yeah being really real. I mean, they'll just laugh. Yeah. And so I guess the question is, okay, what is really the full, and this may be for Matt, uh, what is the focus of the task force? I mean, is it for purposes of mental health counseling? Is it full member well-being? Because we, we cannot dictate what a firm is going to do. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And I think that you, you know, there's uh, of the, you know, we're member focused, some members will be in favor and some will say that I don't need this, you yeah. know, I could deal with my own fashion. So I just really kind of curious is the breadth of what the, the whole group foresees here, because I, I don't think this is as simple of a, of a, of a remedy here as just simply saying, we're going to give you um, X number of sessions. Yeah. If that was the remedy, we just go back to what's done before. Yeah. And I don't see that you need a task force for that. So I guess that I, I don't understand the need for a task force at this point in time, although I'm in favor of, you know, looking into it, but what are the parameters is really what I don't understand. Is this on? Well, I'm going to invite Dan to jump in if I'm not covering everything, but generally the task force is to expand our reach because the staff in the member wellness program don't have the capacity to understand what's going on in uh, large law firms, what's going on in small law firms, what's going on across the industry and the state. So bringing in all these stakeholders onto a task force is giving us the insight and the reach we need to get inside the profession so that we can understand it and then look at where are the systemic issues happening. There are systemic issues happening in our profession that are driving people to addiction and suicide and those kinds of things. And until we understand it in this state, we can't do anything about it. So it's to gain understanding and expand reach so that then we can start looking at solutions to help people. And we may not be able to solve all the problems, but until we understand what they are, we have no hope of solving them. And so a task force will give us to reach into it to better understand it and then start addressing it from a systemic level. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I want to piggyback on what Kevin just said that, um, you know, this telling everyone just to work less is not going to fly. I agree. And um, each venue of the profession has different needs. Right. When, when a lot of the work on, on law firms, there's a well-being pledge with 
over 200 signatories nationwide, and Perkins Coie was one of the first ones. And it there was a whole host of uh, agreements in that pledge around communicating leave policies, as an example, and other ways of dignifying the role of mental health and well-being for those uh, associates and partners. Um, for, for the bench, we're noticing that mentorship programs are in dire need and that they're not connecting with fellow judges. Um, I can go on through all the different venues of the profession, but the, for solos, uh, a lot of them are quite isolated. So finding other ways to not be isolated would, might be a recommendation. Now, would a recommendation compel a law firm to do these things? No, not necessarily, but I think it matters hearing it. Uh, from the state bar that we've explored this topic and have this recommendation, and we, we're not going to bite off more than we can chew with this. We can only do one thing at one thing at a time. Thank you. I just want to say, uh, Brett, in answer to your question, the tax force will come back to this body for any recommendation whatsoever, and at that time, we would have been able to understand the problem enough to be able to make if we all we can do if all we can do is to make recommendations to big law firms and said you might want to look at this you might want to look at that we would be able to do that so it's it's, it's going to be um, a work that is going to demand a lot from this tax force and i think we are up to task yeah all right okay. Alex. Yeah, next. Actually, Francis, uh, I'm running the meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. As chair, so you told for me four o'clock, and I'm trying to rush. Responsible for that. Sorry to be yeah, to take, take take control here of the meeting, but okay. So Tara, then Alec, okay, and then Andrew. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand the intent of the first prong of the motion. So it says to add member well-being to the Board of Governors goals that are adopted June 20. So we're in the process of setting goals. Yes. So is the idea that like this one's on, done, and then anything else we add? Or is it to sort of make sure that it gets considered as we set goals? It's on. It's on. Okay. okay thank you. Um, Al? Well, the reason I uh, went ahead and moved this, my understanding especially with the second one, is that what, what I'm saying is giving you the grant of authority to go and now work the details about what the task force would do. Well, one, proposing a task force, what it would do, what its scope would be in terms of looking at what's the best approach to actually assess what our well-being uh, program would look like. And and that's all I'm I'm doing right now. I don't think that that second part actually says establish a task force. It says work on it, come back to us mm -hmm. if you believe that that's where we should go with a charter that then answers all the questions about what the task force is actually charged to do. Yes. And so we we haven't gotten down into those weeds yet, but that would be the grant of authority that we would give you in the motion and at least that was my intent why i made the motion yes, for you to go forward and do that um understanding that you're going to come back with the details that the devil is always working you know around but you will come back with that fully proposed idea and i didn't give you a and as i i did here and and you're not time or, you know, you got to do it by June. You know, do what you need to do to give a fully fleshed out charter charge, um, you know, and the elements that you're going to look at in in developing a task force and what their their job will be. Thank you, Alex. So, so, so that I'm clear. Um, in June, the, this board will be setting FY24 goals, and and this will be part of that. Yes. Based, okay. That's great. It. Thank you. Okay. So, not seeing any more hands, uh, let's go ahead and, and go for a vote then. Hey, Governor Adewale. Yes. Governor Anjovel. Aye. Governor Boyd. Aye. Governor Couch. Aye. Governor Dresden. Aye. Governor Fay. Aye. Governor Kading. Not present. Governor Wynn. Aye. Governor Petrasic. Aye. Governor Pertzer. Aye. Governor Rathbone. 
Aye. Governor Sayani. Aye. Governor Stevens. Aye. Governor Williams Ruth, not present. Motion passes unanimously with two governors not present. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. I was quickly going to say that I listened intently on your previous conversation about the rural issue and uh, Yakima would actually almost be Montana's largest city. And and so people would be flocking to Yakima in Montana. Um, so <laughs> I think that's it's kind of funny. So I live in Missoula. We're the big city, right? And we're, we're 75,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. 